Today on Outdoor Oklahoma, just as important as water and air, every human on Earth relies on and is connected to pollinators. Learn more about this important connection and the management role each of us can play right now on Outdoor Oklahoma. Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. There's really only a handful of things in this world that affect every single one of us. We all know we can't live without water and air, but an easy one to overlook on this short list is the importance of pollinators. Worldwide, about 1,000 different plants that are used for food and beverages and fibers and medicine are solely dependent on pollinators to grow. And in the U.S., about one-third of all agricultural output depends on pollinators. So let's take a look today at the important role that the little butterfly plays in our daily lives. Well, where we're at is the butterfly house here at a place called the Papillion in Honor Heights Park. And uh, we have uh, one of the best displays of butterflies in Oklahoma. These butterflies are all found in Oklahoma or at least in the southwest. Right now we probably, on any given day, we probably have around 10 different species of butterflies and they vary as the summer progresses. House. My name is Tom Roberts and I work here at the park as a, a horticulturist, a zoologist, and a naturalist. This guy is me. I kind of was raised on Fort Gibson Lake in the outdoors and spent most of my youth out hunting and fishing and hiking. When I went to college, I focused on science, particularly zoology and even more specifically on ornithology. Um, after I finished my college, I went to teach school. Uh, once I finished my teaching and retired from teaching, I started working here at the pavilion at Honor Heights Park last fall um, and been doing that since. So it gives me a chance to still stay in the educational field, but at the same time, I get to be outdoors more. I spend a lot of time on nature hikes, out in the field collecting butterflies for the butterfly house, uh, working in the gardens, and um, I enjoy that, get out of the classroom now. All right, you're familiar with the life cycle of the butterfly? Mm -hmm. So you have the eggs, you have the caterpillar, and then we have the pupa, which this is what these are. Mm -hmm. These are chrysalises. So we got different species of chrysalises here. We've got, there's monarch, we've got 
tiger swallowtail, we got the zebra long wings, the great southern white. But what we have to do is I have to get these ready to hang in the butterfly house. So, you know, in nature, the, butter, the caterpillar attaches itself to, like on the bottom mm -hmm. of a leaf, you know. So what we're going to do is kind of simulate that. So what I do is put just a little dot of hot glue okay. on my string. And then I take the chrysalis, if I can do that, and I attach it to the glue, like that, to the stem. And basically it hangs like that until it emerges, okay? So yeah. why is this man a corkscrew? Well, that keeps the string from sliding left or right on it, keeps and it, it in place. And it's also so it doesn't make too much friction? Right. Well, you know, when the butterfly emerges, he starts to kind of squirm around a little bit, and you don't want the string to work its way off of the rod, so it kind of helps keep it in so place. So a bumpy thing? Yeah, kind of rough like that. Well, there's been a great decline in the number of pollinators in, in the world. Um, I'm sure you've heard stories about the monarchs and stories about honeybees. Well, this is a chance to educate people about the value of pollinators and the necessity to try to protect them. So this is a great tool that we use to, to, to accomplish that. Yeah, my background coming into this job is mainly in ornithology. And my knowledge of the world of Lepidoptera, which is the study of butterflies, was very limited. But since I've been doing this job and collecting butterflies, I've learned a, a lot, a lot of information. Um, in the park, I mean, we've got tiger swallowtails, we've got black swallowtails, pipe vine, uh, spice bush, red spotted purples. I mean, I can go on with quite a big list, but there's a lot of different species of butterflies in our park that I've learned about. Yeah, we're, we get visitors from all over the country. Um, come here. I think, of course, Honor Heights is renowned for its azaleas, and but people come here and realize we got this butterfly house, and they really enjoy coming here and interacting with the butterflies. You know, butterflies will land on their land on them. Uh, they have a chance to see them up close and personal, see chrysalises, see the butterflies emerge from their chrysalises. It's it's uh, they get to see all stages of the butterfly development. Well, one of the questions I sometimes am asked by the public is, you know, why do we need to have a butterfly house? Why do we need to educate people about butterflies? Well, I can tell you as an avid duck hunter, waterfowler, um, you know, people wonder why we have waterfowl hunting. Well, understand that um, you need to educate people about every species of living things on earth and their place in the ecosystem, that they all play a part. Well, in turn, the butterflies have a very important role they play with pollinating plants. And if you think about it, all the plants that you eat, even the meat that you eat, involves a pollinator directly or indirectly. So they're very valuable, so it's important to get that message across. And so, you know, I, I feel like if you're a true, you know, naturalist or outdoorsman, you need to understand that big picture. Okay, to see the butterflies, uh, we are open from Mother's Day through Columbus Day from 10 until 5 o'clock um, Monday through Saturday, and on Sunday we're open from 1 until 5. Now, in the uh, non-butterfly time of the year, when, you know, when things start to go dormant, the gardens are open free to the public to come in and see, and we always have plants, uh, ornamental type plants available to, you know, for people to look at. Well, now that we can all agree on the importance of the impact that pollinators have on us, let's take a look at the impact that we have on pollinators. A subtle thing like urbanization can lead to habitat fragmentation or even complete habitat loss. But no matter where you call home, from the most rural parts of our state to the most urban, we can all play an active role in the management of pollinators. 
handpicking certain types of plants that attract pollinators for your wildlife habitat easements, your flower garden in front of your house, or even just the windowsill of your apartment can have a positive impact. Biologists have discovered 202 different butterfly species right here in Oklahoma. One of the greatest needs of migrating butterflies is a reliable food source for when they return back to our area in the fall. So now let's visit the OSU Botanic Gardens in Stillwater and discover what fall blooming plants that you can landscape with that are most beneficial. Hi, David. Hi, how are you? Doing well, thanks. How are you? Oh, doing well. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for meeting us here. For those that aren't familiar with our beautiful background, can you explain where we are and, and the, what your guys' role is here? Sure, you bet. Uh, this is uh, the OSU Botanic Garden, and it's actually part of our research facilities as well. So we have about 100 acres total. Wow. Um, where we have a lot of research going on and trials going on with uh, turf. Uh, that's, we have a big turf program here, um, as well as nursery production and a lot of other things. This site right here is uh, our studio gardens for okay. Oklahoma Gardening. And we have about four <laughs> acres of manicured gardens that we use for taping and filming the show there. All right, so you guys are definitely focused on plants. And from the wildlife department angle, we're really thinking about the wildlife aspect. And we're so excited that there's so many places and, and things that homeowners can do to you know make their, their property a little more wildlife friendly. So we were hoping we could kind of meet here and, and talk about some of the different plants that landowners may end up putting in their in their wildflower garden. Sure, yeah, you bet. We have a lot of plants out here and obviously they're not all native plants, um, but we still have a lot of great plants that we can use. And uh, we have a nice little native plant garden right here. Perfect. Um, we have other native plants spread throughout the garden, but this one's kind of focuses on a lot of the natives that grow here. And you can see there's some that are blooming right now. So, you know, this is late in the year, right. great fall, you know, fall plants and plants that provide pollination. And there's a ton of pollinators Yeah, pollen right and here. nectar for, yeah. uh, for a lot of our pollinating uh, insects. Um, and so this is a neat plant. I really like this one. It's, this is one of the sylphiums. Okay. Um, it goes by compass plant, cup plant, actually rosin plant as well. <laughs> um, but I like it because I do like the, the fact that this one has the, the leaves are attached right at the stem. There's no okay. petiole uh, providing a little cup. Okay. So when it rains or if you're irrigating, um, it'll catch water there and that provides a source of water for our insects and birds and things like that. Great. But the, the insects love this plant. It yeah. grows six, seven, eight feet tall uh, under ideal yeah. conditions. Yeah. So and it'd be a lot of good screening cover too. Good screening <laughs> cover, yep. And it's a perennial, so it's gonna come back every okay. year um, right. with no problems at all. Uh, this is another plant that's very common throughout Oklahoma. This is called Snow on the Mountain. Okay. And it is uh, an annual actually, and will come back from seed very, very easily. And it's very colorful this time of year. It's one of the euphorbias. Okay. Great. Also very tough plant will grow in just about any type of soil and growing conditions. Great. So one thing that I'm hearing from you on both of these plants seems to be that they're they're pretty low maintenance. So somebody that doesn't really have a green thumb, they might be able to grow these in their own backyard. They sh yeah, they should be able to. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, a lot of our natives, again, are adapted to our, our climate and our growing conditions. So they do pretty well. Now, remember too that natives, um, not all of them are quite as attractive sure, <laughs> as sure. these plants are. Um, not as showy. <laughs> not as showy, and some people would even consider some of our native plants as weeds, you know. Very so, true. but uh, they do provide, um, a, they are a good resource for uh, our wildlife. Great. Well, these are two great plants. Can you show us a few others that might we might be able to put into a sure. in a wildflower yep, garden? Let's go take a look at some more. Awesome. Thank you. This is another garden that I wanted to show you. This is our sun perennial garden, and wow. we have several species in here that, uh, again, are excellent uh, perennials for fall okay. um, and for the pollinators. This is one of our natives called uh, ironweed, oh. and there's actually several species within Veron Vernonia, which is the genus. Okay, look at that color. It's beautiful. Yeah, aren't they gorgeous? Yeah. I just love them. They, uh, they grow all over the state and actually eastward. Okay. Um, and uh, they're very tough. You find them growing, again, you know, growing along the roadsides and and uh, 
they provide this excellent color late in the okay. season. So I feel like I may have seen ironweed growing in the roadsides, but it wasn't quite this tall. Is, is this a different species? There are different species, and some do grow much taller than others. But, you know, we also water a lot in this garden. So, <laughs> you know, the ones you see growing along the roadside, they're, they're, uh, they're not getting cared for quite as sure. much. So sometimes in sense. the garden, they'll grow a little bit taller than they would out in the wild. Okay. Perfect. Um, and then another one that's very popular, a lot of people are familiar with this one. This is the uh, goldenrod, um, the solidago species. Okay. And, you know, it has these bright yellow uh, flowers, um, but it also gets a bad rap because it blooms the same time ragweed blooms. Oh. And ragweed is actually what causes a lot of the hay fever, the allergies so this a time of, of year. People may be blaming this. They might be blaming this, yep. It actually has a heavier pollen than the ragweed does, so it's not going to be flying around in the air. So it's the one that gets the bad rap, but it's an excellent uh, native species, has beautiful yellow flowers yeah. in, the, in the fall. And then uh, this group right here, that we actually have several plants. These are all the milkweed plants. Okay. Um, some Asclepias, uh, which, you know, is, makes up a lot of the common milkweeds that we have um, found growing all over the place. And these are obviously very important to our monarch butterflies. Um, sure. They all bloom at different times. Some bloom earlier, some bloom in really dry sites, some like, you know, more prefer more moist sites. Um, but we have several different species that grow. Actually, I think there's almost two dozen species wow. of uh, Asclepias that grow throughout the state and are, are very important, especially to the monarch butterfly, so, but other, other, other butterflies sure. as well. So not only do they provide pollen for, for pollinators, but they also serve as a host plant, correct? Exactly. Oh. So they're, uh, they provide the nectar and the pollen for the butterflies. Um, but they also act as a host plant for the larva, which is very important, especially okay. to our uh, monarch butterflies. Sure, sure. Do you, do you know any other host plants that the larva might uh, be able to feed on? Yeah, so the passion flower, passion vine, is an excellent um, host for the fritillary butterflies. Um, dill is great for the swallowtails, okay. and there's a number of others. Perfect, thanks. Do you have any other plants that you'd like to show us? Sure, yeah, let's go take a look at a few more. All right. Let's walk up here. There's another species, uh, very popular, very common, are the helianthus species. Okay, so, so the sunflowers, sunflowers yeah. Right. And uh, they're obviously very popular plants. There's annual as well as perennial forms of helianthus. Oh, okay. And they provide, of course, great pollen sources for a lot of our uh, pollinators. But also, you know, it, it, after they start going to seed, they provide, they're a great resource for our birds as, Absolutely, as well. Absolutely, yeah. So, really popular for birds. Yeah. And then one, one more down here I wanted to show you. This is another Vernonia, or ironweed, that's native to eastern Oklahoma. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, this one's called Vernonia lettermanii. Okay. The leaves are more needle-like, very thin. Okay. Um, so it has a really nice um, soft texture, but still provides that beautiful purple flower. Yeah, that's nice, great. And then, you know, we've been talking about perennials, uh, but we have a lot of other native species, especially woody plants that oh, are great okay. pollinating plants. They typically bloom earlier in the year. But, uh, we have some great ones like the sumacs. Okay. Uh, There's several different species of sumacs and they're great uh, resources for a lot of uh, wildlife. Um, and then one of my favorites is the button bush, Cephalanthus species. Those okay. are so cool. I just yeah. love them. And they're the ones that grows by water, correct? It does. Okay. It grows a lot. Typically found growing along the stream banks and in ponds and lakes. So they do like the moist growing conditions. Okay. But they actually do really well in a normal landscape situation. So we've seen a lot of great plants here at the, the Botanic Gardens of OSU. And the department has our Landscaping for Wildlife book that, that kind of shares some of these tips. But do you have any other resources that you could share with us? There's a lot of great resources that are available, um, lots of stuff online. One uh, source in eastern Oklahoma is the Kerr Center. Oh, sure. And they actually have a wonderful publication uh, that's available online about pollinators. Uh, there's the Xerxes Society, of course. Um, and then um, a number of other uh, fact sheets and, and other resources that you can get online. And then when it comes to buying plants, and that's the big question, that's, that's what everybody wants question. to know, where do I buy all these plants you've been talking about? The well-established or the larger nurseries will often carry some of our natives. And then we have some really good um, nurseries here in the state, uh, Bustani Plant Farm here in Stillwater. Okay. Um, the uh, Wild Things uh, Nursery, they actually sell, I think, mostly to um, at uh, farmers markets and okay. places like All that, right. you know, events. They don't actually sell out of their uh, store, okay. I don't believe. 
Um, and then there's Sunshine Nursery out in Western Oklahoma. Those are just a few of the native plant sources that we have and, and great plants people that work at those uh, places. Well, great, well, we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge of, of Oklahoma's plants with us. It's, it's been really helpful, thank you. Uh huh. You're welcome. Of course, some pollinators might not be too desirable around your house. <laughs> See what I did there? So keep this in mind. Bees tend to prefer flowers that they can walk on to sip nectar. But butterflies need a big flat place to land on the flowers they visit. So they prefer flat-faced, broad flowers. Probably the poster child of butterflies would have to be the monarch. Their annual migration from North America to Central America is one of the great wonders of the animal kingdom. And from recent news reports, you've probably heard that they're in decline, which has scientists concerned. But we here in Oklahoma are perfectly poised to have a direct impact on the future of the monarch. As we've talked about earlier, what's good for butterflies is good for all of us. So we hope that you'll take advantage of the resources that we've shared with you today and do your part. Thanks for joining us today. And for all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead, and we'll see you right back here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma. Fishing. Hunting. Wildlife management. Resource protection. Habitat conservation. Public outreach and education. It's what we do. It's what we live for. Simply put, conserving wildlife literally means the wise use of wildlife. And that's at the root of everything we do. <coughs> Oklahoma is one of the most species diverse states in the nation. making sure opportunities exist for hunters, anglers, and all those who appreciate wildlife is not only our job. It's our passion. We are your Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. From sunup to sundown, and sometimes all night long. The employees of our agency are relentless in their dedication to a job well done. The science behind wildlife conservation is constantly evolving, and our biologists are leading the way with groundbreaking and cutting-edge techniques that the entire scientific community benefits from. If that's not enough to make you proud, then consider this. We've been doing all this since our agency's birth in 1909, without using a dime of taxpayer money. That's because the Wildlife Department is designed as a user-pay, user-benefit agency. It's sportsmen and wildlife enthusiasts who pay the bill for wildlife conservation in Oklahoma. Revenue from the sale of hunting and fishing licenses make up the majority of the agency's budget. There's also another unique way that outdoorsmen contribute financially. Each time someone buys a gun, ammunition, fishing equipment, or fuel for their boat, a small portion of the tax they pay at the register is used for wildlife conservation. But hunters and anglers don't just contribute financially. A long time ago, we recognized that sportsmen are our most effective management tool. Shaping regulations and making sure everyone complies to them has played a major role in bringing many species back from the brink of extinction to unimaginable numbers As much as the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation has accomplished, we are positive our agency's best days are yet to come. You can see it on our faces. You can feel it with your hands. 
and you can hear it on the landscape. You'll find us working hard to make your state's natural resources the most healthy in the land. We are. We are. We are. We are your Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. Uh -huh.